So, hello, and welcome to Truth You Can Wake Up To. I'm Samuel William, on the 28th of January 2012. Now, I want to start this episode by reporting a crime. The perpetrator is George Osborne, our Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom. And his crime is negligence in his uh, duty of office and conspiracy to defraud the British public. Now, what am I talking about? Of course, I'm talking about the banking situation. Everybody is aware that it's a problem. I think in the back of their minds, most people realise that something criminal is going on. We're being robbed, we're being lied to, but also we're being defrauded on a huge scale. Now, here's the good news. If you have a loan or a credit card or anything like that, you do not have to pay it back. And in fact, as a form of direct action to right the wrongs that are going on in uh, this world, doesn't matter what country you're in, you should stop paying your loan. Now, it seems like a bad thing to not pay your loan back, because if you borrow some money, you should honour that agreement and pay it back. Well, sort of. So to understand this, we need to understand how a lawful loan should work. Now, if you ask the vast majority of people out there about banks and loans, they'll sell you the propaganda story that the banks have programmed us into thinking, which is that when you borrow some money, the bank has that money to lend to you, which is false, entirely false. They don't go to their vault and take out a bit of money and ask you to pay it back as soon as you can. No, they create the money out of thin air. They just type it into your account. So they create money which causes inflation. So I need to talk a little bit about inflation. For those of you that understand it very, very well, I apologise. I'm not going to spend too long explaining it. But for those that don't, the entire economy is made up of a certain amount of money, a certain amount of units. Let's say the entire economy is made up of £100. So £100 one coins is the entire economy, just for illustrative purposes. So each one of those pound coins is exactly one hundredth of the entire wealth of the nation. Now, if a bank comes along and creates ten more pound coins out of nowhere, they just appear, now each one of those pound coins is now worth one one hundred and tenth of the entire economy. So each unit has been devalued because of inflation. Now, if you had deflation, you took that 10 new pound coins away, of course, you're back to 100. Each of those pound coins is now the value of one one hundredth of the entire economy. So you've revalued or increased in value each individual unit. So that's inflation and deflation. Now, the way that a loan should work is that it should be a self-liquidating loan. And we used to have these uh, not too long ago. If you wanted to buy a house, you would borrow some money. It would be created into existence. And as you paid it back, it would disappear out of existence. So you caused inflation by creating the money. And then you caused deflation by paying it back. So essentially, the worth, the value that you are, that you are borrowing with that loan comes from everyone else. Everyone who holds that currency gets devalued for a short while, while you've got your loan. And then as you pay it back, everybody gets revalued. They get an increase in value. So you're borrowing from the entire community and you're paying back the entire community. So what happens? What is the situation when you borrow from a bank? Now, the first thing we should say is the very curious nature as to how the bank gets the money to lend you in the first place. Now, believe it or not, banks cannot create money. No, they need 
you. You, as a citizen on the land, are the only ones that have the ability to create money. That is why banks need you very, very much. In fact, when you come into a bank and you ask for a loan, they'll get you to sign a document, which is essentially a promissory note. So if you want to borrow a thousand pounds, you will sign a promissory note for a thousand pounds and you have created that money. And technically, it is yours. If you were to borrow it and never pay it back, then you're causing inflation, but never causing deflation, which would be bad for everybody because everybody's savings would decrease in their purchasing power. Prices would become more expensive while wages are not going up and all that kind of stuff. It's bad. So if we had a lawful loan, it's a really good idea to pay it back. And if you want to be an honourable citizen, then that's exactly what you should do is to pay it back. However, when you create this promissory note within the bank, they are performing an administrative role. They are basically saying, we will do the paperwork in you creating this money. We will administrate the repayment of this loan. But there is something fraudulent going on within the situation. In actual fact, when you create that money, that promissory note, you're essentially writing a check to your bank. They can cash that check. They put it into an open account, which does not have anyone's name on it. When it's put into this account, it essentially doesn't belong to anybody anymore. And after a certain amount of days, the bank can claim that money under a very, very old law. It's called British Admiralty Salvage Law. They are essentially saying that this money has been abandoned and we're now going to claim it for our own. Once they've claimed it, they will lend it to you and they'll put it in your account. And of course, when you pay it back, instead of paying it back to your community and causing deflation, the bank just keeps it all, including the interest. So they caused inflation by creating your promissory note, which was borrowing it from your community. They then took that money under salvage law, lent it to you, and then never paid it back to your community, never causing deflation, causing a permanent decrease in the purchasing power of everyone else's money. That is the fraud. Now, it's important to remember here that if you stop paying your loan back to your bank, it is impossible for you to cause them a loss. They do not lose anything because they brought nothing to start with. All they did was claim some money that they said you abandoned. So if you stop paying them back, they're not losing a single penny. Of course, they're not gaining the huge amount of profit because, of course, whatever your loan amount is, they're getting all of that plus the interest for free without doing anything other than the administration and a little bit of sleight of hand. So you should have no moral feelings about not paying it back to your bank you should have moral feelings that the bank is not paying it back to the community from which it was taken. And seeing as your bank is not paying it back, when you pay the bank, you're not paying off your loan. You're just filling their pockets. You're congratulating them for defrauding you. What we need is a lawful system of loans where the loans are paid back to the community, causing deflation and increasing the wealth in everybody's pockets. And we're not going to get that until we start arresting some of these criminals. So next time you're watching the TV and you see an advert for a bank and it's all this lovely soothing music and this sort of childish imagery and all these people with smiling faces saying, we're here to help you. These are criminal entities lying straight to your face programming and hypnotizing people who don't understand these things. George Osborne knows what's going on. He understands that the banking system is stealing the wealth of the country every single day on every single high street. He knows, but he does nothing 
to remedy this situation. He is complicit in the fraud and he is complicit in the conspiracy to defraud. So if you want to stop paying your loan, there are two things you need to do. One, you need to stop paying it. So cancel that direct debit. Don't pay any more money, not a single penny to them. Second, you send them a letter. Now, it's very, very crucial that you do not communicate with your bank by telephone. I cannot illustrate this enough. The people that you speak to on the telephone are very, very good, very professional at getting you to agree to things that you don't really want to. The way that they word things and they do word play and they all try and take you down a little road. They are uh, the, the people that you're speaking to on the phone, of course, aren't bad of mind or corrupt per se, but they are following the script, which is the result of a lot of science into social manipulation and man manipulation of speech and manipulation of people. Of course, as soon as you stop paying your loan, they're going to be phoning you and phoning you and phoning you and phoning you. My advice, change your phone number. It's as simple as that. Now, the letter. A lot of people will be worried about a bank taking them to court if they stop paying their loan. So I want to say this. A court is there for one simple purpose. It is to arbitrate between two conflicting parties. So if you've got a bank saying you must pay and you've got a human being saying I refuse to pay, that can go to court. So what you need to do is you need to agree to pay. It's actually called conditional acceptance. So you send them a letter saying, I agree to pay anything that I lawfully owe under the condition that you show me four things. Full disclosure, equal consideration, lawful terms and conditions, and two wet signatures. These are the four binding things in contract law. You must have full disclosure. They, they needed to tell you exactly what was going on. Of course, they didn't. They didn't tell you that the money was actually yours in the first place. It was taken from your community and not out of their vault. They were letting you assume that they had the money themselves, so that it was the bank's money, but it wasn't. So they never gave you full disclosure. So they can't provide you with documentation of full disclosure. Equal consideration is the second one. In any contract, there needs to be equal consideration on either side. So both parties have to put something at risk, let's say. The ability to lose something. Otherwise, it's not uh, a contract. Of course, the bank didn't bring anything of value to add to the contract. They essentially brought nothing. They stand to lose nothing if you stop paying, which is why it cannot be a lawful contract because there is not equal consideration, especially if this is in terms of a mortgage loan because you could lose your house. They can only gain a house. So it's completely warped over to their side uh, they are defrauding you uh, of course the third one is lawful terms and conditions uh, they can't produce those because they do not have them and fourth it's probably the most difficult for them for it to be a legally binding agreement you need signatures from both parties wet signatures it needs to be between two human beings any contract for it to be lawful needs to be between two human beings. Of course, in order for the bank to abide by that, they would have to have an employee or somebody from the bank representing the corporation as a human. They never had that. You signed, as a human, an agreement with a corporation, a piece of paper. Therefore, it is not a lawful contract and it evaporates into thin air. So you send them this letter. On the bottom of the letter, you should say, please reply within 14 days. 
failure to reply with substance, and I'll get to that in a second, will mean that the debt has been dissolved. Now, substance is very, very important. This is a legal thing. It means that if there is a an argument about certain things, you can send a letter from one party. A response has to be relevant and valid and a response to the letter that you wrote. Then it has substance. If it's just a generic letter saying, oh, we don't recognise what you've just said and, you know, please pay us anyway, that's not substance. They have not interacted with your letter of substance, which means they've gone into dishonour and they have lost. This is very important because if they don't respond in substance, that after 14 days, then you have won. And if it ever went to court and you have a copy of this letter, the court will rule in your favour. Now, it's very important that you send this letter through recorded delivery, so you have proof that they have re received it. And if they don't respond within 14 days in substance, then you give a following up letter by recorded delivery saying, you have not replied uh, to my letter dated such and such, with substance within 14 days, I therefore dissolve the debt. Now, I'm just giving you an overview here, so uh, don't write what I said verbatim. Uh, research it. Have a look out there. There's lots of stuff, uh, even templates uh, of much better wording than I've used uh, in order to be able to do this, and also advice as to how to sort of follow up afterwards. Uh, one of the best places, I suppose, is uh, FMOTL. Dot com. Uh, they sort of give you a lot of advice on there, uh, but lots of other places you can uh, find out about this as, as well. Uh, but you must not just take my word for it. Do the research first before you take action. Uh, you need to be confident about what you're doing. So that's it from me today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, do check out my YouTube channel, S. Williamism, and uh, maybe subscribe if you like what you're hearing. But until the next time, I've been Samuel William, and this has been Truth You Can Wake Up To.